Welcome back to Autism at Home, brought to you by us at Early Autism Project Malaysia through our non-profit initiative, The Hope Project. My name is Joshebet Isaacs and it's so nice to see you again. Now this is the final lesson in our play series. So if you've watched all the lessons up till now, thank you for sticking with us and we hope it's been helpful. Today, we're going to be talking all about games and sports. If you remember way back to our first lesson on developmental stages of play, the final stage of play is cooperative play, where children start to truly play with each other. This is an exciting time to explore games and sports as a way of solidifying those skills and strengthening friendships. So what's the difference between a game and a sport. A game is any form of structured play where there are usually rules to the game. There are some games that are competitive, but some games that need cooperation to win. There are the more classic preschool type games like hide and seek and duck duck goose. There are also more sit down type games like card games and board games. Think of Uno, Monopoly, Checkers, and then there are computer games and online games. For example, games like chess online, where you can play against someone halfway across the globe or with the computer. A sport, on the other hand, usually has much more established rules, often governed by international bodies. Most of us are familiar with sports and can name at least two or three that come to mind, like football, badminton, basketball. There are many obvious benefits to playing games and sports. For games in particular, they can build a wide range of cognitive skills. A simple memory card game where you need to find two identical matches of cards in a face-down deck trains your working memory. Some games require planning strategies ahead of time, like Battleship. Sports, on the other hand, is a more movement-based and a great source of exercise for helping children burn off excess energy and reduce repetitive behaviours as well. Most importantly, the development of gross motor skills. Both games and sports strengthen gross and fine motor skills in some way. A sport like football gets a lot of healthy running into kids, while a game like Operation requires the laser eye focus and muscle control of a surgeon. And finally, games and sports teach us how to be gracious winners and losers. Games and sports start to become important as children enter the associative and cooperative stages of play. Children may start with much simpler versions of games and sports before the rules get more complex. For example, working together to build a jigsaw puzzle is far easier than playing a sport like basketball together, where you need to remember all the rules, pass the ball, play to your team's strengths, and work under a common game plan. So the best age to start teaching games and sports really depends on the complexity of the game. In other words, how many skills they need and how many rules there are. To be honest, you could play peekaboo with a nine-month-old, and that's still a game. The rule simply being find the missing adult. Two-year-olds would be able to take part in simple treasure hunt or play games like Simon Says. For more formalized sports, it may be appropriate to start at ages like six or seven. This is because by then a child hopefully has developed the physical skills and attention span necessary to begin learning. This does not mean you cannot play sports before then. You can simply introduce it in a simple, fun, manner at home. For example, start with water play before you start swimming. For the purposes of simplicity in this lesson, we will introduce you to two categories of games we typically teach at EAP and rank them in level of difficulty. Of course, these skills are non-exhaustive and you might even have ideas of games unique to your culture and family. First are preschool games, which can be played as early as two-year-olds for typical children. Here's a list of preschool games we typically teach from easiest to more complex. You may already be familiar with a few. The second category are board games, which for these purposes, we will include card games as well. Because there are so many, we've divided them by general age levels. 
but be sure to check each board game for specific age recommendations. If you would like to teach your child a game, you should try to match the game to your child's developmental age instead of their chronological age. And games usually have prerequisite skills a child must have before they can play it successfully. For example, a child who is chronologically five years old but has the developmental age of two years old will find snakes and ladders challenging as it requires skills like sequencing numbers, taking turns, understanding rules of going up ladders, going down snakes. So once we have a game in mind, we need to break the skill of learning the game into small steps. Children's games can sometimes be more complex than we give them credit for, particularly for a child with autism learning it. Let's take a look at just a few of the rules a child needs to learn in Uno. In a game of Uno, the cards come in four colours, and each colour can have a number from 0 to 9. Then you can only match the same colour to colour, or match the same number to number. You can also add in additional cards if they're the same number, like a blue or a red and yellow 9. But you cannot do this with same colours. Then you've got the issue of power cards you can use. The skip card skips the next player, the reverse card switches playing directions, Add a draw two card only if it matches the colour on the deck. You can put out multiple draw two cards at once, even if they're different colours. That's just seven rules in UNO so far and we haven't even covered them all. So this really shows us how a simple game can actually be really, really complex. This is why we must take the time to list down all the steps our children must learn and teach them one by one. So coming back to UNO, if you are teaching it to your child for the first time, try taking out the power cards first. Teach your child to match just based on colour, then match based on numbers, then together. After that, you can introduce each power card one by one. How about sports? Don't they have even more rules? How do we teach them? You don't need to wait to sign your child up to a football club before exposing them to sports. Simply follow the same principles as before on breaking the skills into steps. If you're not sure what sports to start with, explore what your child already likes through simpler forms. If your child likes water play, maybe they will like swimming. If they enjoy climbing, they could like rock climbing. A common sport that also doubles as a useful survival skill is swimming. There are many factors to think about when breaking the skill of swimming down. How deep is the pool? How far do they need to swim? Which style should they learn? Are they able to hold their breath underwater? And for how long? On top of that, will your child need to tolerate wearing a swimsuit, goggles and swimming cap even before they can get in the water? You may well spend weeks desensitizing to the different swimming attire needed before even setting foot in water. As a general rule of thumb, this is the order of skills a child should learn when beginning to swim. Desensitizing to swimming attire, tolerating entering the water, being able to float, inhaling above water and exhaling under, beginner strokes, and then more advanced strokes. If you would really like to teach your child a sport, it is recommended to consult with a professional or even work with them to break the skill down for your child. And of course, for both games and sports, remember to keep the other two key strategies of reinforcement and practice high. Learning a new game or sport can take weeks, months, or even years to master. If it is something your child is showing skill at and you would like to develop further, be sure to ensure that they get plenty of practice a week, but also reinforce them for all that hard work. Pop quiz. Stava is learning how to play hide and seek with his dad. When he is hiding, he talks loudly. When he needs to seek, he forgets who he's seeking and he walks off. Which of the below can break the skill down for Tava? Teaching hiding first, then seeking, use visual rule cards, show video models, or use strong reinforcements? A, B, and C. 
Splitting the game into smaller steps and using lots of visuals can only help Kava understand more of what is expected. Do note that just because reinforcement is not part of breaking skills down does not mean it is not important. Kyle's mom has decided to enroll him in football at school because he has shown an interest in it since young. What are the skills Kyle will need to be successful at football? Understanding the rules of the game, being flexible with winning or losing, being able to take turns with his team, or being able to follow instructions. <laughs> Sorry, that was a tricky one. The answer is all of them. This is just to show us how many skills must be built first before they can work together to play a complex sport like football. Now it's your turn. If you are keen to start a new game or sport with your child, first check if the game or sport is appropriate to their age. Then sit down and take time to break the game or sport down into steps. If you're not sure, consult with your partner or a professional it is better to have things too broken down than not broken down enough. And finally, start teaching, always keeping the three key strategies at the back of your mind. Break skills down, practice and reinforcement. And so this brings us to the end of our play series. We really hope the developmental stages of play and all the different types of play, interactive, toy play, sensory play, imaginative, everything has been helpful to you and your family. If you haven't already, do check out our free online resource platform, Autism at Home, which has all the corresponding articles and necessary downloadables for you. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Instagram and Facebook to stay updated. Autism at Home is brought to you by The Hope Project, which is the non-profit arm of Early Autism Project Malaysia. All the content development, our clinical expertise and time is completely borne by us at EAP. And the production of these videos so far are funded solely through donations and fundraising. If you find these resources helpful and would like to contribute in some way, please do pledge a donation at autismmalaysia.com slash The Hope Project. Thank you for watching and take care.